Welcome to part two of our video series on the aerodynamics of sailing, winging, and windsurfing. In this video, we're going to talk about the parts of a wing. We'll talk about the axes of flight. That's axes, not axes. We're not going to chop anything up. We'll talk about angle of attack and its lesser known cousin, angle of incidence. And we'll talk about stalls and we'll talk about drag. And we'll also discuss takeaways, AKA, why do we care about all this stuff? As always, it's good to remember that I am just some random guy on the internet who likes to put my dog in my videos. Anything that I tell you could be completely wrong. In part one, we talked about wings and how the airflow over a wing creates a force of lift that lifts the wing up into the air. In part one, we mentioned that you can make something that looks like the top half of a wing and use that to create lift, which is what we see when we look at a hand wing or a sail. We talked about how a wing can create lift in any direction relative to the ground. So if we tilt or bank an airplane on its side, the wing is going to create lift in a horizontal direction, pulling the airplane horizontally through the air. Again, we can see this with a hand wing. If you tilt the wing over to one side, like you see here, some of the lift is still being directed in an upward direction, holding the wing up in the air, but some of the lift is also being directed in a horizontal direction, pulling you across the ground or across the water. This is what we see when we look down at a sailboat sail or a windsurfing sail from above. You see the sail creating lift horizontally, pulling the boat across the water. A windsurfing sail works the same way. And that was the main takeaway from our last video. We can think about a sail or a hand wing as behaving just like the wing of an airplane, creating lift, pulling us across the water. Let's talk about the parts of a wing. When we're looking at an airplane, we call the very front of the plane the nose and the very back of the plane the tail. We call the front edge of the wing the leading edge and the back edge of the wing the trailing edge. Same with a hand wing. We call the very front of the wing the nose and the very back the tail. We can call the whole front edge of the wing the leading edge and the whole back edge of the wing the trailing edge. Since the sail is a wing, we can use those same terms, leading edge and trailing edge. Although with a sail, we normally use the traditional nautical terms. We call the front edge the luff and the back edge the leech. But if you say leading edge and trailing edge, that's totally fine. Now let's talk about the axes of flight. If a wing is directly above your head and you tilt the nose up and down, you're changing the pitch of the wing. With the wing above your head, if you twist the nose to one side or the other, that's called yaw. And when one wing tip or the other tilts down, that's called rolling or banking the wing. It's useful to remember that these terms, these movements, pitch, yaw, and roll, are all relative to the wing itself, relative to the body of the wing. If the wing is flying directly above your head and you tilt the nose up higher away from your feet and the tail down lower, closer to your feet, you're changing the pitch of the wing. When the wing is tilted to one side and you move the tail closer to you and or the nose farther away, this is still a change in pitch. To make things a bit more simple, when you move the trailing edge or tail end of a wing or sail closer to you, we call that sheeting in. When you move the trailing edge or tail end farther away from you, we call that sheeting out. Sheeting out is usually associated with going more slowly, and sheeting in is usually associated with going faster. There are exceptions to that, but that's generally how it works. Now we're going to talk about angle of attack and angle of incidence. If you look at a wing from the side and you draw a line straight from the center of the leading edge through the center of the trailing edge, we call that the chord line. If you think about the airflow over the wing and the direction that airflow is coming from, what we usually call the relative wind or apparent wind, the angle between that direction of airflow and the chord line is what we call angle of attack. So a simple way to describe angle of attack is it's the angle at which the relative wind or apparent wind hits the wing. To understand why we care about angle of attack, let's think about a symmetrical wing, 
a wing with the same curve on the top surface and bottom surface. When the angle of attack is zero, it means the airflow is hitting the leading edge of the wing straight on. The airflow over the top and the bottom of the wing will basically be the same. So at a zero angle of attack, this wing won't create any lift. We could say that the wing won't be able to create any force on the airflow to create lift. One example of this is when we're in the basic start position on a windsurfing board. The wind's at our back and we're just letting the sail luff or flag in the wind. So it's at a zero angle of attack and not really creating any lift. See, I knew we were gonna need that Smurf. If we start to increase the angle of attack, we'll start to see a difference in the way the air flows over the top of the wing compared to the way it flows along the bottom of the wing. And that difference in the airflow is what allows the wing to create lift. So we can say that this wing has to have some type of positive angle of attack in order to create lift. And as we increase the angle of attack even more, we're gonna see the wing create more and more lift. In general, increasing angle of attack increases lift up to a certain point, which we'll talk about in a minute. So if we think about our sailboat sail or a windsurfing sail or a wing, and we visualize or imagine the boom as showing us approximately where that cord line is of the airfoil, we can picture the apparent wind creating that airflow over the sail. We can visualize our angle of attack which is what's allowing the sail to create lift and pull us across the water. If we sheet out, we're gonna create a smaller angle of attack, which is going to decrease lift. It's gonna depower the sail. And we'll start moving more slowly. If we increase the angle of attack by sheeting in, the sail's gonna create more lift, more power. And we'll start moving faster across the water. So changing angle of attack changes the amount of lift, but changing the angle of attack by itself doesn't necessarily change the direction in which the airfoil creates lift. In general, we say that an airfoil creates lift perpendicular to the direction of the airflow. So at a 90 degree angle to the relative wind or apparent wind. And that doesn't necessarily automatically change when we change the angle of attack. So if we sheet out or sheet in, we'll feel a change in the amount of lift that the wing is creating, but we won't necessarily feel a change in the direction of the lift. What about a negative angle of attack or a negative lift? So that is a thing. Just to review, we're talking about how the angle between the apparent wind hitting the wing and the cord line of the airfoil is our angle of attack and that allows the wing to create lift. And here we're talking about what we would call a positive angle of attack. As we said earlier, if we have no angle of attack or zero angle of attack, the wing doesn't create lift. So what if we go even farther and reduce the angle of attack even more? That would be called a negative angle of attack. At a negative angle of attack, the wing creates lift in the opposite direction from normal. So now our wing is creating lift towards the wheels of the airplane. And this is kind of cool because this is actually how an airplane is able to fly upside down. The pilot flies with the wing at a negative angle of attack. You might notice the same thing if your wing is upside down and you lift it up off the ground or out of the water. We can say the wing is at a negative angle of attack. The wing is creating lift in the direction of the handles or the boom and that little bit of lift is helping to hold the wing up in the air. When sailing or windsurfing, we don't normally talk about negative lift or negative angle of attack because a sail is a symmetrical airfoil. It's designed to create lift in both directions. There's no normal direction of lift and opposite of normal like there is with an airplane wing. When a sail creates lift on one side, we call that a port tack, and when it creates lift on the other side, we call that a starboard tack. Okay, we promised to talk about angle of incidence, so let's do that. If you look at the cord line of an airfoil and you compare it to some other fixed reference line, so for example, if you draw a line through the center of the fuselage of an airplane from the nose to the tail, if you compare the cord line of the airfoil to that line, that's what we call angle of incidence. 
if you look at your foil and you compare the angle of the fuselage or maybe the cord line of the front wing, you compare that to, let's say, the bottom of the board, that would be angle of incidence. People will often call that angle of attack. And the world probably won't come to an end if you call it that, but technically that would be angle of incidence. And it is good to keep in mind the difference between angle of incidence and angle of attack. With angle of attack, we're comparing the cord line to the apparent wind, or in the case of your foil, to the flow of the water. And with angle of incidence, we're comparing the cord line to some fixed reference line, like the bottom of your board. Okay, let's talk about stalling a wing. We've said that as we increase the angle of attack on an airfoil, the amount of lift will increase. And it works that way pretty much all the way up until a point called the critical angle of attack. As an airfoil passes the critical angle of attack, the air can no longer stick to the top surface of the wing. So the airflow breaks away from the top surface and we get this very, very turbulent airflow over the top surface of the wing. There's going to be a very dramatic decrease in lift. And we call that a stall. It's fun to watch someone stall a ram air skydiving parachute. So these are wings that rely on ram air pressure to stay inflated. The forward speed of the parachute through the air forces air in through openings in the leading edge, and that's what keeps the wing inflated. When we put one of these parachutes into a stall, there's a very sudden decrease in forward speed and decrease in ram air pressure, and the parachute folds up into a fun little fortune cookie shape. In this video, you see the lift increase as we increase angle of attack, and then decrease as we pass that critical angle of attack. The canopy folds up and we pop it back open. A good time to think about this is when you're windsurfing and you first uphaul the sail and sheet in to get going. A lot of people will sheet the sail in really tight, pull the sail in really hard. And all you're doing at that point is pulling the sail flat against the wind that's coming from behind you and you're just stalling the sail. When we want to start moving, it's better to sheet the sail in just a little bit at first. Get that little bit of positive angle of attack so the sail can start creating that horizontal lift to get you going and pull you across the water. It is different when we're going fast because as we pick up speed, the apparent wind that we feel and that the sail feels shifts around to the front. So the wind feels more like it's coming from the front of the board, from the nose of the board. And that's why when we're going fast, we want to sheet in more. We'll talk about that a little more in part three of our video series. And of course, all this applies to winging too. When people are new to the sport and they're trying to get going, you'll often see them sheeting in really hard, pulling that wing flat against the wind. When it's better, when we first stand up, to actually just sheet in a little bit, let that wing start creating lift, let it give you some forward speed, and then you can start sheeting in more. Okay, let's talk about drag. So drag is a force that slows us down. And there are basically two types of drag that we can talk about. Parasitic drag is created by air molecules bumping into something, or by the friction of the air sliding over a surface. So when you're out sailing or foiling or windsurfing and you feel the wind blowing in your face, you feel the wind shaking your clothes, that's parasitic drag. A second type of drag is called induced drag. So when a wing is creating lift, air is gonna spill over the wing tips from the bottom surface around to the top surface. The air is gonna curl around those wing tips and it creates these swirling vortices of air, these little tornadoes of air trailing off behind the wingtips, and that's called induced drag. And just like parasitic drag, induced drag slows a wing down, which is why some planes have the little winglets at the wingtips to block that swirling air and reduce induced drag. We often talk about drag when we're talking about foils, and particularly the size of the front foil wing. Some people say that smaller wings are better because they create less drag. And to some extent, that's true. But a number of different factors affect the performance of a wing. So a larger wing has more surface area and it will create more drag, but it's also going to create more lift with that larger surface area. All other things being equal, a smaller wing will generally need more speed to create the same amount of lift as a larger wing. 
a larger wing's ability to create more lift at lower speeds may be an advantage depending on what you're looking for. In terms of takeaways, we've sprinkled a few of them throughout these first couple of videos. We've been throwing a lot of definitions at you, defining a lot of terms, but hopefully the main thing we've done is help you visualize what's happening when you're out playing with your wing, or when you're out sailing, or when you're out shredding on your windsurfing board. Hopefully you understand why you want to sheet out a little bit and you don't want to sheet in real hard when you first stand up on your windsurfing board or when you're winging and you're not really moving yet and you're just trying to get started moving through the water. And if you're new to foiling and you're thinking about buying a foil, maybe this will help you think a little bit about the size front wing that you want rather than just going for that small sexy one right away. All right, thank you again for watching. Please remember to like the video and subscribe to my channel and share this video with your friends if you know anybody who might find it interesting. If you haven't watched part one of this video series, then you may want to check that out. Check out my website, scottmillercoaching.com, if you want to see what I do when I'm not windsurfing and making videos. And keep an eye open for part three of this video series. In that video, we're going to talk about the wind and a little bit more about that term apparent wind that we used a few times in this video. I might even do a fourth video and talk a little bit more about how a fin works or a centerboard or what's happening when you're pumping your foil and how everything we talked about in this video applies to that. So if you think that would be interesting, if that's something that you would like to see in a video, go ahead and leave a comment in this video and let me know. Smurf on a windsurfer.